Hello and welcome to Open Your Mind Radio. You have myself, Alan James. And you have myself, Stephen George. Good evening. Good evening. We have a, a, a change tonight. We have a round table. Our guests are the National Citizens Movement. And we have Alan, Dermot, Jamie and Liz, who's going to be coming on and telling us all about the National Citizens Movement. They're going to be looking to change that into a political party. And hopefully we'll get the information. We'll talk about Irish water. We'll talk about... The, uh, their mandate and what they're planning to do and various other bits and pieces and, uh, and any other things that we can add to the, the mix because there's a lot of things going on in Ireland at the moment outside of Irish water there's bigger things going on so we need to really talk about that but before we do that we have a few things to talk about and we have to find out what the communication channels are yes we do and if I, can, if I can just say, if anyone is wondering or is unsure what a round table is it's like a square table with the edges taken <laughs> off <laughs> <laughs> sorry Oh, you know what? It was a bad joke. I apologise. <laughs> okay, communication channels, please, Mary. The communication channels are email info at oymireland.com by phone 046 and you can also contact us direct through the OYM chat room. Yes, you can contact us through the chat room. We have the oymradio.com is the website. You can click on the live chat button. You can log in there. You can ask questions. You can just chat amongst yourselves. We also are streaming live on People's Internet Radio chat room as well. So we're going to be watching that one for questions too. So hi to everybody in there. We also have anti-social media on the website as well. That's Facebook. It's oamradio.com, I think, forward slash... No, it's not. It's facebook.com forward slash... (laughs) Yeah. Facebook.com forward slash OYM Internet Radio. Uh, we also have a YouTube channel as well where you can uh, catch up with uh, the latest podcasts and videos and there's all sorts of fun stuff on there for your viewing pleasure. We're also on the TuneIn Radio app as well. And as well, as I never mentioned, but we are actually streaming. We have a, a stream in Ireland, a stream in the UK, and also a stream across the pond in the US of A. So hi to everyone listening to, on all three streams. Alan. Brilliant stuff, Steve. Um, before we bring uh, the National Systems Movement in, there's a few things as usual that we're going to talk about. Wow, what a week we had this week in Ireland. Um, apart from the snow today, obviously, that's just the weather side of things. Yeah, we had a little bit of snow, a bit of sprinkling. From? Yeah, no, a bit of a sprinkling, and then uh, the sun came out, and that was it. Uh, the four seasons in one day, as usual, over here in Ireland. But, yeah, what a week. Um, a lot of things going on this week, and we're going to be talking to uh, Dermot. Actually, Dermot said he was um, at this... Uh, event that happened last week, last Monday, I believe. And we have a, a, a politician, we have a, a TD over here called Ray Butler, who's a TD, a politician for the government party Fine Gael. Uh, Fine Gael. And basically, um, allegedly, um, one of the ladies who was on the peaceful assembly that night outside of his office wanted to, she stayed back to actually talk to Ray because she knew the chap. And basically what happened was, apparently, and I say allegedly, that she, um, he got in the car and basically, I won't say reversed, but she was somewhere in the vicinity of the car and he actually hit her, apparently, and she had to go to hospital and get checked out as well. And he drove off, so he left the scene of the crime. Now, I wasn't there, I, I'm just going by what I heard on Facebook and social media. Dermot was there, so... Hopefully we'll get some information as to what happened on the night. But I believe Fiona's okay. But it's not really nice for a TD or anybody to be um, running down the electorate or reversing into the electorate. Um, I think there's a bit more going on there as well. So not really, really good. Um, So basically, uh, I believe Fiona's okay. But as I say, we'll talk to Dermot about that. So not very nice. Steve? Yeah, no, I mean, I heard about that as well, and it's it's disgraceful. But, of course, I believe the next day, and I think the day after as well, uh, Mr. Butler was on every radio station and also every printed media. Did, well, he, did he have a group of people playing violin behind him? I think he did, yeah. Oh, right, okay. And there okay. was some subconscious messages getting getting uh, beamed across radio waves as well. But, seemingly, yeah, he was on uh, a couple of different stations. I believe News Talk 106 uh, to give Dennis O'Brien's uh, radio station a plug. I think he was on that as well. He was also in printed media, as I say. 
and again he's he's completely he's the vi- <coughs> excuse me he's the victim he's playing the victim yeah apparently hollywood has been in touch they're looking to make it into a movie they they are actually yeah <laughs> <laughs> with ray butler playing himself because yeah. they, could, they couldn't find anyone sad enough to play him <laughs> but uh yeah so i believe uh he was on he did kind of give his side of the story you know um obviously before anything happens or any any investigation is on the way he wants to uh you know get out there and say oh it wasn't me and you, you hear things that oh the lady wasn't actually knocked down by the car that uh he was reversing back you know according to the rules of the road very astutely you know and she just she walked up and she ba- she banged on the car to to pretend like but uh, i just say them was there so we, we find out exactly what happened and yeah, what else is happening um, it just brought to my attention uh, this evening by Alan, which I, I wasn't really aware of, but seemingly Fox News, Fox News, or as some people call it, F-A-U-X News, faux news, I believe that's French, oui, oui, yeah. is that French? Oui. French for false, is French. it? I don't know, F-A-U-X, it is, it is, yes it is. Okay. Stop shaking your head, no, it is, it is, it is, just, there you go, not, not, it is. Faux News or Fox News, and you get on with it, I say. Uh, seemingly there's a bit of an expose about powerful men, young girls and cover-ups. Uh, seemingly, why is Bill Clinton in the middle of all this? Epstein flying young girls out of the powerful, out for the powerful elite to have their way and uh, underage kids. And you were saying that's an expose that was done on, on Fox News. They're talking about paedophiles and it's, they're talking about like high-ranking paedophiles. Exactly. And this was on, this is on the kind of elite's own media. So I'm very, I was very surprised. I did put it up on my Facebook. I'll have to put it up on OIM for people to listen to because I was a bit shocked that Fox News would, would actually come out and do that. So I don't know whether there's a change in a, a sea change going well, on maybe there. Maybe there is because... I'm very surprised yeah, at that. You normally know? you don't really... I mean, normally well, you kind of... It, they, they'd be uh, kind of like RTE would be over here. You, you'll hear like the government side of the news. So, I mean, yeah, yeah if, they, if... I'm kind of surprised myself with that. Yeah. You know, yeah. you'd wonder... Uh, I'll have to, I'll have to know, post it up. Yeah. Um, the other thing on the news is that uh, TDs, they apparently are supposed to be representatives of the people. Well, that's what they call themselves. And I believe there was a chap attending a conference and a meeting, and he was... There's a video that was on the social media, uh, Facebook, and he was surrounded by the Gardaí for protection. And um, I have to say, you know... That for somebody who's supposed to be, you know, uh, representing the people and supporting the people, he's surrounded by Gardaí. I don't know what's going on there, you know. Um, gone are the days that you'd go up and just chat to the TD and tell them what's going on. Or he'd knock on your door and stuff like that. Now you can't get 10 feet near them. And um, I'm, I'd be surprised if uh, the, the judge or the judicial system brings out some kind of injunction saying you can't get within 20 metres of a TD. Something like the water meter, I'd be very surprised. Uh, well, I wouldn't be surprised if they came out and said that. Um, it's the way things are going at the moment. And the last thing on the list is that we did change our Facebook profile. Uh, we had to change it from a user profile to a page. And obviously, the data and the graphics that were on it, obviously, Facebook, um, don't carry them over. But we have a backup of them anyway. So if anybody wants any the graphics that we've have done, the funny graphics that we've done, we we have a backup of them. And also, we're going to be launching the new website during the week. Fingers crossed. If everything goes okay, and the eyes are dotted and the T's are crossed, we launch the new OIM website. And it's kind of a cut down version of the one we have. Um, does a we're going to have more of a subscription rather than a user login. And you can subscribe to the newsletter. And I'll be sending out an email during the week anyway. We'll be doing that to let people know when it's going to happen. And it's just an, an upgrade on the system, responsive templates and all that kind of stuff. So it's going to look great on, on uh, other devices like mobile phones, uh, smartphones and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, basically yeah. It's, it's really formatted for smartphones and tablets. And, and you, were, like you were talking about uh, RSS feeds. Yeah. Yeah, so people, like when news comes out, it'll just go straight to your, well, your feed. Well, that's, that's what we need to talk about. Yeah, we need to have a chat Sorry. about that. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking out of school here. Sorry. No. <laughs> Sorry. You didn't get my memo then? No. No, okay. Um, no, I, got, we, I got the check. I just cashed it. I didn't, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't read what was on the back. Okay, so we'll have to talk about that. We haven't decided on that. But that's something that we can add to. Anyway, the OIM app is available on the Google Play Store. You can download the OIM app on the Google Play Store. And we, obviously with the new website, you might be updating that as well. But we'll see how we get on anyway. A few things to do. Few busy week going to be this week doing the development side. Um, also, the app for the National Land League um, is up there in Google Play Store as well, if anybody wants to download it. Steve, how was your week? 
Yeah, I'm glad you asked. I'm just kind of backtrack real, real quick there. Talking about apps, uh, I did see uh, some information during the week. I don't know how true it is because, again, this is another thing that was on Fox News. But maybe it is. There was a chap on who, who he was kind of an expert on apps uh, for for mobile phones, and he did say that a lot of people are downloading apps for flashlights for mobile phones. And he said, just be careful. He actually went into a kind of a long spiel about it, and and I'm not going to do it here. But he did say, be careful with the app that you download. If it's in and around file, the file size is in and around say 100 kilobytes KB, then that's that's okay. But if the file size is anywhere, you know, between, say, I don't know, up to five megabytes in size, between one and five megabytes, he said, then it's going to have, it may have a lot of spyware in it. So therefore, when you, when you turn on the, the, the flashlight, uh, it will record everything that your phone sees, uh, video and audio. And I think it, there's other stuff built in as well that can copy data from your phone and it'll send it wirelessly. Obviously, be wordlessly to uh, people in other countries. He has done it, done a backtrack on some of these uh, little phone flashlight apps, and he said some of the information that is getting recorded by the phone is getting sent to. I think he said one of the countries was China and the other was Russia. He did mention a third one, which I uh, escapes me at the moment. But anyway, just just keep that in mind if you do have one of those on your phone. Anyway. Uh, what else? Yeah, I just want to talk about real quick. We had a meeting on Thursday last in Kells with Paul Murphy. He, he was actually doing it. Uh, it was a kind of a protest. Well, it's not a protest. It was a, a meeting. And he was attending it in with uh, Kells against water charges. It was kind of a last minute dot com thing for me. But uh, the wife suggested that we go. So we did. We went down. And uh, uh, Paul was there. He gave a great talk. There was uh, uh, Seamus McDonough was there as well. Seamus uh, gave uh, uh, the introduction for Paul. Seamus had a lot of information too, which he shared with us. And uh, Paul got up. Paul said a, a, a lot of things. Also, John Wilson was there. I didn't realise it was John Wilson until the, the very end. Do you ever see somebody, you're kind of going, I know that chap from somewhere. He obviously lives around here, you know. And then when, when I was talking to Seamus after, I said, oh, sure, sure, that was John Wilson. I'm going, oh, was it? He says, yeah. So John was there and, and he had a few things to say, but it was good. Got a, had a, a quick yap with Paul after the, the meeting and uh, I've snagged him. He's going to come on. So hopefully it'll be may, maybe next week. Uh, it could be the week after, but, but we're, we're kind of aiming for next week. So that's going to be good. He had a lot of information to share on Thursday that people, well, some of it I wasn't aware of and some I was, but... Uh, yeah, it's amazing, like, because when, when you actually got t- got chatting to him, like, after he finished giving the presentation, he shared some more information about stuff that's actually going on on our, you know, on our doorstep that we just, we're not aware of. Anyway, uh, what else we got? We have the nude man in Buckingham Palace climbing down the sheets. Uh, seeing that during the week, that's kind of gone viral on Facebook. There's a lot of uh, interest in that. People are saying, oh, yeah, it's some guy who was being abused and, you know. There's a lot of stories going around. I don't know if it's true or not, because a lot of people are kind of debunking the whole thing, saying he climbed down, uh, as was just mentioned here on our own chat as well. He wasn't uh, reflected in the window. There was no reflection. So I don't know. Is it true? Is it not? I don't know. But it looked it looked very convincing when I when I seen the video. But you know, check it out. Have a, have a look for yourselves. Anyway, uh, what else have we got? TV license. A lady was uh, sent to Mountjoy Prison from Donegal. She was, uh, I think, ten past seven. One of the mornings, she was arrested and uh, brought down to Mountjoy Prison, where she served a couple of hours, and then she was given a twenty euro bus ticket to to uh, get the bus back home again. It's laughable, it really is. Again, she she uh, she she was in the middle of paying a fine for non uh, she didn't have a TV license, so she had she, yeah she had no TV license, and seems she got I think it was a four hundred euro or four fifty euro fine, and she had paid two hundred and something euro off the fine. But she hadn't paid the rest. So seemingly, yeah, she was arrested, brought down, and I mean, talk about a waste again, a waste of taxpayers' money. It just it, it beggars belief. Of course, she shouldn't have opened the door in the first place. She just looked out the window and said, "I don't, I do not recognise you." Anyway, what else? Last thing on my list, I uh, just want to talk about real quick when we're talking about uh, people's pay scale. Uh, seemingly, and Kenny's on three and a half grand a week, and he feels, as he said during the week, he's worth every penny. He is worth it. Uh, but just real quick, uh, we have a list here of people in his his staff, if you like. Uh, it's a big list, and their their yearly salary is on it. So the, the actual the lowest salary on it is forty two thousand seven hundred and sixty euro. That's for John Lowen. He's the personal secretary to the Taoiseach, allegedly. 
Uh, and they, they go up from 42 grand, 65, 74, 81. Uh, Andrew McDowell, special advisor to the Taoiseach. See me, he's on 156 grand a year. Uh, and it's just, it's a beggar's belief because they, you know, they're, they're cutting, they're, they're, they're cutting people's uh, wages. They're just knocking money off here and they're shaving money off wherever they can. But yet their own salaries, when, when you see what they're on, and yet they come out and tell you, we understand. We understand austerity. Really, do you? Mm. On, on, on 156 grand a year? I don't think so. Well, anyway, there we go. That's, that's my lot in a nutshell. All said in the one breath. <sighs> How's your week? Oh, that was uh, that's a good week. That's a good week. That was a good, good week, wasn't it? Week. It was. Okay, well, I just have one thing. It's just an email that came in to the show just before uh, we went live from one of our listeners called JJ, and he just said the hub Ireland, uh, and he has four hours, so maybe four hours ago, but he's talking about the repossessions, and he says here he's he sent me over a list, and he said um, repossessions on the second. Um, I take it it was the 2nd second, second of January, I assume he's talking about, because um, it's, well, it's not the 2nd of March yet. Yeah. He said 30 in Cork, 45 in Tullamore, 17 in Waterford, 60 in Dundalk. Um, repossessions on the 3rd, 40 in Carlow. Repossessions on the 4th, 19 in Longford, 35 in Monaghan, and 62 in Cork. And repossessions on the 6th, 219 in Limerick. That is just unbelievable. That's incredible. All these repossessions going on. Where do these people go? Well, maybe we have a solution to it. Maybe we have a solution. Maybe we have a new party that's coming on board. And the party is going to be the National Citizens Movement. And uh, Alan was on the, has been on the show before. And Dermot was on the show before. Um, and we'd like to bring on Liz and Jamie. Now, they're all involved with the National Citizens Movement. And they've been doing some fantastic work. Feet on the, on, on the ground. Going out and um, being involved with the peaceful assemblies and recording stuff, being involved, doing speeches, doing talks, concern about Irish water and concern about Ireland uh, in, in particular. And like all of us who's, who probably have done, the, done this and went out and got involved with the marches and got involved with the protests and everything else, um, we just feel we have a moral conscience to do it. We feel that we know it's wrong. It's fundamentally wrong. And, you know, there's no harm in telling the truth. The problem is, is that... I remember politicians talking talking about politics and the whole PR game. And these politicians were saying, well, actually, people don't like the truth. Even though you want to tell the truth, if you tell the truth, you, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, so you're better off lying. I kind of disagree with that because I think sometimes, well, you have to tell the truth, but you can tell it in a way you know, that you can be kind of diplomatic about it and not just too blatant. So, but what we're going to do is we're going to get in Alan, Jamie, Liz and Dermot and we're going to find out, first of all, about the National Citizens Movement and then we'll talk about Irish War, the protests and the bigger picture in Ireland and what's going on. So, good evening folks, how are you? Good, thanks. Good evening, Alan. Okay. Hi, hi, Alan. <laughs> how are you doing? Okay, well, good evening, Alan, how are you? I'm great, Alan. Thanks very Brilliant. much. Brilliant. All right. I just want so people can understand or know who's who. Uh, Jamie, hello. How are you? I'm good, thanks. All right. Dermot, how are you? Not too bad. Good stuff. And Liz, how are you? Hi, Alan. How are you? Good stuff. All right. Guys, you know, it's been... You've had uh, some phenomenal success on Facebook and social media with the amount of people that have signed up on Facebook. You have, I believe, 25,000 people, something like that. Can you confirm that? Yeah, just over it. Just over 25,000. That's fantastic yeah. for one group. And it's brilliant. And a lot of people want change. So I'm just, it's going, going to be more of a round table. And everybody will, you know, questions will come in from the chat room. And then we'll ask everybody the question. But whoever wants to jump in and, and talk or answer the question or mention something or talk about it, please go ahead. And we'll try and include everybody so everybody gets a say. But um, so whoever between yourselves wants to talk about the National Citizen Movement. Tell us who they are and tell us all about how you came about and what you plan to do. Um, well, I come in here and yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. Um, the National Citizens Movement, Alan, was, was, was basically set up on the 9th of August last year in Cork. I felt that there were so many national protests going on in relation to water and there was all splinter groups going along. We were all singing from the same hymn sheet, so I said we'd get one another into the same room and see could we trash out what issues were, revel were relevant in relation to how we can fight this. You know, what 
came from it was that the lack of accountability and the power the government had and how powerless the people felt. So we basically set up the page. We started 24 hours, basically. We were advising people on the law in relation to um, your, your, the contract. We were explaining it to them your rights in relation to the meter. Um, Alan done his own thing in relation, it, 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 as far as the uh, meters was concerned because basically what Irish Water are doing is they're infringing on your constitutional rights your right to the peaceful enjoyment of your property, your right to health, your right to bodily integrity, oh. everything. And from then, it just kind of grew. People just flocked to us like um, because they could see something in this completely different to what was on offer um, from all the other parties because nobody came out. You see, this was a grassroots movement. It was a social media-led movement, and people connected with it because we weren't... Uh, like, OK, I ran as an independent myself in the local um, election, so did Alan, and Dermot came from direct democracy. So we put all our political um, affiliation or political ideas to one side and put the public interest as the, at, at the paramount consideration here. And I think that's basically what drew so many people to it, you know. OK, and Alan, Dermot or Jamie, do you want to add to, to that? Yeah, if you like, um, it's actually... Alan, when you think of it, I first heard of Liz uh, on your program. Uh, uh, the three of us, myself, Liz and Dermot, came on your program back before August last year. And, and it was on your program that I was introduced to Liz first. And Liz had come at it from a different angle. Uh, I've known Dermot for a while now, for probably over two, two to maybe even three years. Uh, I've met Dermot on numerous protests outside the doll and everywhere else. So... I, I, I personally know him, Dermot. Uh, but Liz came at it from a different angle because me and Dermot have been out protesting all the time. And what Liz introduced on your show was the idea of challenging this in the courts to say that, you know, it, it's another weapon in the people's defence is to not only march on the streets, not only carry out acts of civil disobedience, which me and myself and Dermot have done on numerous occasions. Uh, Liz has said, look, let's take it in, in, cell, in inside the courts. Let's, let's challenge them there. Now, we've had limited success. Now, Dermot has done that himself as well. So at the moment, out of three cases we initiated, there's still two ongoing. And Dermot is up next now on March the 5th in the High Court uh, with a case against the Irish Water. And I'll let Dermot explain that to you. I don't, I don't feel it deep. And Liz can tell you on the other one. Uh, we look for the judicial review. Uh, uh, with Ordish Water and looked at the constitutionality of setting it up. While that wasn't granted to Liz in the court, she now has a, a, has a authority from the High Court again to proceed with a plenary summons, which Liz will tell you as well. Now, I think what attracted people to us was that we were trying every avenue. We were not only protesting on the streets. Me and Dermot, like I say, we've taken out the needles, we've taken them out publicly. Uh, we try to show people uh, that we've moved from a very, very safe system where the water system was sealed, where no one could interfere with your water, to a system now where it's open and it is actually unsafe. And we've shown that publicly. We sent the, the videos around to Noreen you know, O'Sullivan, the Garda Commissioner. We sent it to all the TDs. So people, I suppose, have been watching this online. And what's happened in the meantime, myself and Liz didn't know Jamie starting out. Jamie now is based in, in Ballina in County Mayo. So I presume Jamie can explain to you how he got involved with us. But Jamie came on board, invited us down to Ballina to the group of people they had assembled there and introduced it to us, fabulous group of people. We've been invited up to Donegal. We met another fabulous group of people. We're meeting people in South Dublin uh, there only today and we're setting up another branch in South Dublin and in, we have one already in North Dublin. So it's grown piece by piece and people have been asking us. I mean, I was with people before profit and I stood for election with people before profit in May. But to explain about myself, Alan, I'm 51 years of age and while I was always uh, politically motivated and politically astute, I paid attention to what was going on. I was never really involved in politics. Apart what what happened with the with the depression rather than recession, it got me annoyed to see what the likes of trade unions who were supposed to stand up to people, he'd abandoned the people. The likes of the Labour Party who had voted for myself before had abandoned the people. 
So you start to become involved. And, and as this is growing, I felt, well, people before profit was good. Uh, Boyd Barrett does a great job. I just felt that with the National Citizens Movement, I have a wider reach and a wider attraction to people because sometimes while Marx and Marxism is is a good economic theory and should be studied, Marxism as such is looked upon as a failed system. And in a sense, the more we quoted Marxism with the Socialist Workers and the Socialist Workers Party, it kind of, Marxism is looked upon as communism, it looked upon as failed. So I just feel... Well, in a, a socialist, I would argue, in a modern-day socialist. So the attraction to me was more with the National Citizens Movement. So I've just resigned from people before profit. And that's where we are now. So we've been asked to set up a political party. Um, if I believe now if we can turn that, there's 25,000 people on the main page. We have another group of people in Mullingar with uh, Dermot, with Benny, uh, with a few people out there. Who are a great group of people. We've people in North Dublin, like I say, South Dublin. We've people in Waterford and Wexford, and uh, we're growing all the time. And their their pages are their own, their own beyond the twenty five thousand. <laughs> so we we have grown and we have attracted a lot of following. It's what to do with it now, uh, and that's why myself and Liz and Dermot has decided. Look, I I think it'd be wise to set us up as as a citizens movement because when you look at the last thirty years of politics in Ireland. You cannot blame Irish people for being suspicious of any politician. They're right to be suspicious of any politician. Because politicians in general in Ireland have let them down. Going back to Irish water, think about this for a second. I mean, you have the businessman who gave a corrupt payment to a Fine Gael politician. That was the findings of the Moriarty Tribunal. And that same businessman now has been awarded the contracts of Irish water. And that same businessman will probably gain financially more than anybody else out of Irish water. How is that right? Mm. That cannot be right. And we thought Fianna Fáil was bad, but actually Fianna Gael could teach them lessons in cronyism and corruption. Yeah. And that's why I'd advise anybody out there, you mentioned at the start of your program, other political parties. I'm delighted to see DDI getting involved and starting up a new party. You have the Irish Democratic Party with Ken Smollin. Ken's a nice guy, principal guy. He's getting up there and started. You have them, you have the hope now are starting themselves as a political party. And that's great for Irish people. Now Irish people have a choice. And at least the people that's putting themselves forward, giving them that choice. We don't have a background of ripping people off. We don't have a background of robbing people, cheating people, lying to people. But that's what you have when you vote for Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael or Labour. You know, so it's great to have another group of people coming on with fresh ideas and presenting them to the public. And it's up to the public who they want to go along with. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's uh, let's bring Jamie in there. Jamie, if you can just say to um, whoever's talking, if you, if everybody else could kind of move away from the mic or um, because uh, there's, oh, there, there's background noise coming in there. Jamie, what's your right. um, where, where you stand with the National Citizens Movement? Tell us about your involvement and how you got started with that. Well, um, we made initial contact with Liz uh, from uh, a bunch of about uh, four or five of us initially um, in Balna here in North Mayo, going back into, I suppose, late September. Um, just, um, you know, a bunch of people sitting back having the chat and realising how, how, how much despair is going around the Irish air. And, um, you know, I'm married, I have three kids, I'm working hard and I get far less than the, uh, the minimum wage that Enda Kenny seems to think is going around this country. And, you know, I mean, look at, I, I was one of those that voted for Fine, uh, Fine Gael, there's no labour up here in Mayo, but, um, you know, I sp- a truly a feeling of despair at the the turncoat behaviour that 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 is just you know plain to see at um at the the state of the nation since this government got in. You know, the promise of change and the lies and deceit and the blatancy of it all. You know, they have absolutely no shame. They have absolutely no remorse for the. Yeah. The, the 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 terrible things they put through put people through so we we um spoke to to Liz initially and um I suppose I've experience um as a as a PRO with a couple of other groups uh, locally here not necessarily activist groups but um and I'm a project manager by day so I just 
uh, tried, I suppose, to put my own skills to use and to rally, rally as many people as we could because, you know, it wasn't just the six of us who were sitting around giving out about things. And, you know, we wanted to do more than just sit around and give out about things. And, um, yeah, we, we, um, we got the, the branding and the Facebook page set up after linking with Liz and Dermot and, um, just ramped things up as quick as we could. And, um, just, we, you know, we made a, a significant presence online and maintained that and we, we still do too. And, um, I suppose one of the key things that we, um, we definitely put across uh, on the Mayo side of things is is information is key and information really is our weapon, uh, whereas disinformation seems to be the weapon of the establishment. And um, it's it's been one of the main driving forces for us. And, you know, in the lead up then to and the planning for uh, the the marches on November 1st um, was really great because we, we had a couple of open meetings um, and we managed to, to get 50 to, to 70 people uh, to, to come to those and they were basically uh, becoming the, the boots on the ground that were able to help them to drive the word out about the November the 1st march and we managed to, to rally 5,000 people on the streets of Balna, something that hadn't been seen since a year or two before my birth uh, at the time of the PAYE, um, the PAYE protests in, in Mayo. Uh, Mayo is a, a renowned sedate county in terms of uh, activism, you might be well aware of of uh, Shell and the Carb gas field out here, and the the reality is that 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 in Mayo people really have become, I think, socially and politically apathetic and failed to engage for a long time. I think the voter turnout percentages have been really appalling in uh, in local or sorry county elections, but also the national elections. So there was an awful lot of, of facets like that really that that spurred our our small group on. So we meet weekly now. Uh, we have a weekly planning meeting that's, uh, uh, with the planning group. It's about, sort of fluctuates between maybe, say, 12 and 25 people that, that come. Um, and, you know, everyone, had, you know, it's voluntary. It's, it's all voluntary contributions. So there's never anything held against anyone who can't make a meeting because we all have our, our, have our lives as well. Exactly. And, um, yeah, so I suppose we meet weekly just to try and make sure the plans and actions are, are uh, are on the table and that stuff is getting done and um, trying to I suppose again share new information and keep keep propagating it out there. Excellent stuff. Well, that's it. That's that's what you can do. If it's anything, I mean, there is great camaraderie between a group of people. I have been to the National Land League meetings out of interest for myself, and we've been down in Trim Court. Um, and just spoke to people about the evictions and stuff like that and repossessions and, and advised them what to do and what to say to the, the, the registrar and stuff like that. And there's great camaraderie. Um, people swap on the stories and everybody in different situations, financial situations. But I will say, and we've said it before on the show, wherever you are living, find a local group that you want to support, whatever that group might, may be, and get involved because everybody can help and do their bit. And that's what we need to do. But I just want to go off to Dermot because there are two yep. things, Dermot. I just want to talk to you about your take on the National Citizens Movement and what you're doing and also what happened last Monday down in Trim. Okay, no problem. Well, the National Citizens Movement, I think what people really liked about it and how the figures went up so quick was because within, let's say, four to five weeks, when we were at that meeting in Cork, as Liz said, on the 9th last year, we said that we would bring about accountability, or do our best to bring about accountability here in Ireland. And within six or seven weeks of that, Liz had went to the court against Irish Water with a constitutional challenge. And a month after that, I took a personal challenge against Irish Water for the safety of the meters and the installation of the boxes. Now, people like that because when you ask politicians to do something, it never gets done, you know, nothing gets done. But here was a, a new organisation that just started up. We said we'd get accountability going, and within two months, we had two cases before the court. And Liz has a great chance with a horse. You've got to play someone's gone now, and I went back in court next Thursday again. Now, my case is a different case. Liz has a constitutional challenge. I have the safety of the stuff, and it's a concern. The video that Alan actually done with Dye that comes out in your tap from the, the danger of the meters. But also in that summons... And for the second part into that summons was the installation of the box, because these boxes, and I mean all the boxes all around Ireland that Irish parts are putting in at this moment, are Class C boxes. And they cannot be put in in a vehicle, vehicular access location. They cannot put them in drivers. They're only for pedestrian areas. Now, I have trawled and trawled through all the regulations. I have them all here for the court. 
and they've broken all them regulations. But apparently these regulations are they're not compulsory. You can sort of turn their nose up to them and then accept the fines down the road if anything happens. But there is a directive that they've broken. It's BC 6, 2009. And Irish Water deliberately broke that directive. And a directive you have to obey. You have to obey it. You cannot just say, no, I'm not going to abide by that. Now, they have broken that, and they have the legislation belong to that. So that's the case that happened before the court. But then again, you're up against judges, and it will be what the judge says in the court. But I have the evidence to present black and white evidence that they're putting in the boxes wrong. They put, they put a box in my driveway, and my wheel of my car goes over that box, and this box only takes 400 pounds pressure. Now, my car, if it's a stall on top of that box, the lid will just broke straight away. In fact, it has broken there a couple of weeks ago. There was a hole in the box in the lid already. But I didn't see there was probably a stone on top of the box because when I just wanted to done our, our estate here, they let rubble and stones all over the place. And of course, there's kids on the street and they kick stones about the place. So I must have just dove over it one night and just cracked the lid. I don't know. But that's the danger of these things. That's the, the Irish water. Like, they're just, uh, they seem to be above the law. Now, the thing is, a politician, if, if we actually engage, we, we sent emails, Alan will tell you, he sent emails to Alan Kelly. But to take this case on their behalf with the dangers of the media and the dangers of the boxes, and these are people we voted for. And he totally dismissed it. He said, oh, you know, you can go to jail. And just totally dismissed it. Mm. But when we showed him evidence that the meters could not be tampered with before the boxes went in, he changed his tune. And he said, oh, you have to take that up with Irish Water. But Irish Water don't want to know because there's people phoning every day of the week. They have leaks all over Ireland, and people are phoning to get the leaks fixed, and they won't come out. All they want is to get the meters in as quickly as they can yeah. and make money. Mm. So it's going to be interesting now. I'm back up again, Torsi. Now, I don't think the case will be dealt with Torsi. I think what they'll do is they say, how long is this case going to take? An hour or two? And then they just put it to a date next month. Because I just, I think they're, I don't know, it's really hard to work out what they're up to. Because maybe they're thinking it's going to fold, and if they carry this on the long finger, that my case will go away. But I'm going to persevere with this, and I'm going to take them before the courts, you know? Well, well, because the, we gave that commitment to the people on the National Citizen Movement page that we would take mm. cases and bring it out to accountability, and we will do that, you know? Well, the great, great thing is, is that all the protesting or the peaceful assemblies are carrying on regardless, which is great to see. I think the politicians expected one or two protests, and he said, oh, people get fed up and then go away, and they haven't. If anything, it's got even better, especially with the whole pri uh, the imprisonment of the five but we'll get to that. We will talk about that. But tell us about Monday night, uh, Dermot, what happened. Well, when I got a phone call, or like just a text message, that there was a land league meeting in the Trimcastle Hotel. So I said, oh, I'll pop across. Because as you say, you were there yourself. There always interesting meetings. So when I went across, they were all sitting around the table. There were about 20, 25 people, and they were discussing what they were going to do. And then in the end, they said, OK, let's go up to Ray Butler's house. Now, I didn't know who Ray Butler was, to be honest. I heard the name all right, but I didn't know who he was. So I said, well, what's the, what's the story? What are you doing? I said, because I'm with the National Citizen Movement. I said, but I'm here on behalf of the Land League. So I said, if I'm going to go with you tonight, it will be with the Land League. I said, it won't be the National Citizen Movement. I said, so I went with them anyway, and we went around to his house. And I have to say, it was the quietest, most peaceful vigil I've ever seen. It was just 20 or 25 people standing outside the house. Ray Butler's son came out, and he spoke to us, and he went back in. And I've done a video of the whole crowd and they were, you could barely hear them whispering talking to each other it was just girls and men talking to each other and I'd done that video and I put it up on the on the page you know and then they were all going back to into Trim at this stage back into the town for a few drinks into the pub so I don't drink myself so I said goodbye to them I said listen I'm heading for Mullingar and when I got back to Mullingar I got a phone call from Damien to say that all hell had broke out outside the hotel now, I can't say what happened outside the hotel because I wasn't there. Yeah. But I went the next day to see Fiona, the girl that was injured. And I was totally shocked when I was saying she was totally in, in a bad state, you know. She was on crutches yeah. and she was heaped mm -hmm. up on the couch. And I said, you're not going home. And she said, well, I can't go home. I have stairs at my home, you know. Yeah. And she was in. Now, I just got a text from her just now. She's actually tuned into this radio station. Mm -hmm. And she said, Dermot, this is, I'm going to read it out. Dermot, this is Fiona here. I am tuned into the show. I am actually not okay. Some of you must have said she was okay earlier. I am barely able to move. I am in excruciating pain, and I can't sleep from the pain. And thanks very much. I think it is important to let people on the show know that I am far from okay. Now, that's from Fiona herself. Okay. Just okay. Well, I know I've met Fiona, and hello, Fiona. Thanks for tuning in there. Um, I think it was important to actually say that on air because... Again, uh, I didn't see anybody, I didn't see RTE or any of the radio stations contacting yeah. Fiona and saying, well, how are you? What's the other side of the story? But the, all the violins came out for Ray Butler. 
And, and just, just if I can come in there, Alan, yeah. and I'm glad you said that I didn't see RTE. Um, I was in work that night, uh, and, and what I seen on social media. Now we talked about Fiona there. Uh, I know the 15 year old girl who was allegedly thrown onto the ground. So do I. Yeah, I know. Well, yeah, I know. Uh, I know that young girl, and that young girl is dead over my house. And if that young girl tells me something happened to her, I believe her. Yeah. Because she's dead over her head, and I know herself, and I know her man. Yeah. And. Basically, I seen I seen texts coming up all over Facebook. I was in work, I seen it coming up all over Facebook about an incident that happened that uh, a woman was knocked down and a young girl of fifteen was thrown on the ground. Now I was concerned, and no one, you know, Alan, and I know, and everyone listening here knows, when something happened, <laughs> Fina Gale was going to put a spin on it, and uh, the media was going to put a spin on it. Now, in fairness, right? People were outside the house. In fairness, I hear the truth of the matter is that Ray Butler's daughter was upset. That's the bit that's true. And I don't think anybody's intention going to march on that house was to do that. But that's, that's a fact. That seemingly was true, that the young girl was upset, right? But I knew that what was going to happen is Fina Gale were going to spin this the next morning. Uh, RTE were going to help them. Every station was going to help them. And I knew that 15-year-old girl as well. So I felt... I put a few tweets out tomorrow in Ireland. And I put a few tweets out, like you just said, Alan. And I said, I hope that when Morn in Ireland are reporting on the Ray B- Butler incident last night, where there was a woman injured and a child thrown onto the ground, that RTE will tell both sides of the story. And I repeat the tweets over and over again like that, hoping that Ray Butler had a story to tell. He's entitled to tell it. But so had the protesters. So had Fiona. So had that young girl. So had her mother. They had a story to tell. And then let the people make up their mind. And, and then, well, what happened was, we had RTE tell one side of the story. Now, a public broadcaster is not licensed to do that. A public broadcaster is licensed to tell the news. And to tell the news is, if an allegation is made against you, Alan, you know, um, you have the right to reply. Mm. It was allegations, and they're very serious made by Ray Butler. And the protesters didn't get the opportunity to reply. And he went into overdrive. And actually, Ray Butler was on LNFM as well. And uh, who commented on it was um, Mike Reid. And Mike Reid suggested I was there. Because he's seen the tweets that I wrote. And the tweets that I... The tweets that I put up, Alan, was that the protesters should have their say. Mm. And uh, Mike Reid put out that it was actually there. And I rang in the station and I made a statement, which he didn't read out Mm. on on air. Because basically, look, both sides of the story should have been told. And RTE failed to do that. It wasn't the intention of the protesters to go over and intimidate anybody. But the young girl was upset. Ray Butler's daughter was upset. That is the truth. Mm. But what's happening here, what I'd like to say to Ray's daughter, and that people people would have heard RTE and would have heard LNFM, and they'd have got very angry, and they would have thought that a family is off limits and they shouldn't have been protesting. Now, I'm asking them people that think like that, that would agree with Ray Butler, mightn't agree with me, but agree that are angry and are really angry. I asked them, the one thing that Ray Butler and the family had, the minute they closed that door that evening, And the protesters went away. The problem was over. I'd ask Ray Butler and the people that sympathised with him to think about the 100,000 families that's facing eviction. Because the 100,000 families, as far as I know, Fiona's facing eviction. And as far as I know, as you know, the 15-year-old and her mum is facing eviction. And they're desperate people. When they close their door at night, the problem doesn't go away, Alan. Mm. The problem is there the next morning. And Mm. I want people who felt angry for Ray Butler to feel angry for the 100,000 people that's facing this day in and day out. Mm. And what our government is doing, and what Ray is doing in his political life, not in his family life as a father, what Mm. he's doing in his political life, when 15-year-olds like that young girl are seeing their mother distressed and seeing maybe their father's distressed and they're seeing their mental health problems, they're seeing their own father, their own families stressing out over the danger of being pushed outside their homes for their homes being taken off them for being homeless. Them 15 year old girls and the likes of them are crying every night. Mm. And Ray Butler and his Fina Gale party 
and the Labour Party. They don't do anything. They're turning their back on the 100,000 people. And that 100,000, actually, it's 100,000 families, sorry, Alan, mm. which Constant Gorbachev told us today is actually 300,000 people. If you took the average family maybe being three or four, yeah. we're saying 300,000 people now are being separated in their society. They're being let go before courts and being evicted. And I'd like to just remind Ray that when people are evicted, we've seen two old people, as you remember, Alan, being put out onto the grass in front of their house at 7 o'clock in the morning. And I know Dermot was there. Yeah. They were two old people, evicted from the home at 7 in the morning. Where was Ray then? Mm. Well, Where this, was Damien the, English? Where was Enda Kenny? Where was Mike mm. Reed and LFM men? Well, this, bring, bring Ray on to explain his story. Yeah. But won't invite the 15-year-old girl on. Won't invite Fiona mm. on. Won't invite that old people that was thrown out of the home. Mm. And I'll ask people that are angry when they heard Ray's story to think about, there's a video going around, and the Land League has shown it, and fair play to them. They've shown a video going around. I remember, I think it's K-Tech Security, breaking a hall door down with a sledgehammer. I want people that are feeling angry about Ray's story to feel angry for them people. Mm. Who are they? They're mm. another family with young children. There's another story told, if you remember, last year in the mirror. And I think it's actually scrubbed from the internet at the moment. Last year, a story was told in the mirror where the van load of people turned up outside the house to, for an eviction with the sheriff, with guard at present, take, took the front door off, the back door off, and proceeded to try to evict the family. And it was only when there was a woman sick inside that they stopped. Again, where's Ray and his party for that family? who are crying that morning. Now, when we're going to have, when we have a justice system in this country, the courts of law, like damn it says, look at what the courts are doing this week, and I know I'm moving probably on a little bit, but we look at the five that was jailed, our five colleagues that's protesting with me and damn it on the streets many a times, and we look at a fella, an, an ex-civil servant went through in front of the courts this week, with 7,000 images of child pornography, on his laptop, and he was allowed walk free. Mm. Now, what sort of court system have we got that allows that happen? What, what sort of court system have we have when the bankers walk free? Mm. And I just like, like to remind the Labour Party is that we have two union officials still walking free in this town that still haven't faced justice over the, you could say the party and on 1.4 million of taxpayers' money in the SIP2 slush fund, them two people still haven't faced court yet. They're waiting longer than the bankers to face court because the Labour Party are more than likely protecting them. So the people that got angry about people protesting outside Ray Butler's own home to his wife and his family, I'd ask them, I'd beg them to keep that anger, to keep that anger for the 100,000 people that's facing eviction that Ray and his party and the Labour Party are turning their backs on. Well, to keep, to keep it balanced, obviously we'd like to invite Ray Butler on the show and to ask Ray and get Ray's opinion on it as well. I mean, I, got, I don't see that happening, but the invite is going to be there if Ray wants to come on. Now, my, uh, I did uh, send an email, funny enough, to Ray Butler there a few days ago and I did uh, talk to him about his role as a politician and as a representative of the people. And I said to him, you know, normally in the corporate world you have objectives and you have achievements. And I just simply asked him, what was the objectives? What was his objectives for the five years he's in government? And what has he achieved in the five years? And I said, I'm not talking about cutting ribbons to open up flower shops. I'm talking about how many people have you helped and stopped from eviction and from being homeless and, uh, you know, repossessions and, and being involved, that, you know, that side of things. And obviously, the email that came back, um, he wasn't too happy with the email that I sent him, and I, I resent the email and I clarified a few points, and uh, to date he hasn't got back to me, and I don't know what the mentality is, but Steve, you want to have a uh, have a say yeah, there? Yeah, I'm just wondering, well, so we'll just talk about the email you sent then. Um, well, you you sending that email and him replying back to it, and then he's not happy, so you have to re-clarify your points again. Mm. Uh, I mean, look... He's, I think you know as well as I do, he's playing games with you, he's fobbing you off and, and that's it. And I mean, there was something come up there earlier on, on the chat and it was the, and I, I heard this during the week as well. Now Alan, I know you weren't there, so you obviously you, you can't confirm this. 
Uh, I don't know if if Dermot knows the answer either, but someone someone said that al- allegedly when Ray Butler drove off in his car that there, that he had been drinking that there, there was a, a clear smell of alcohol on his breath. Now, I mean, obviously th- that's wrong, but look, we we can overlook that because he's a politician. If he gets stopped, he'll just do a, an Emmett Stag. Do you know who I am? And you know that that will be that slate will be wiped clean, and and that's okay. Uh, but the, the fact that RTE can't and won't cover these these things i mean that that if if you or i as a pro as a we're going to say the word protester and this goes to everybody activist. an activist or a protester whatever you want to call us uh, we we say protester because that's the buzzword in 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 the uh in the media at the moment and that's the, the buzzword from the politicians so we're all protesters so i mean if as a protester you or I were to were to do the exact same thing, the exact same situation arose, but instead of Ray Butler being in the house, it was you or I or Alan or Dermot or Jamie or Liz or anyone else out there, and the same thing was to happen, like 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 a, a, a you know a film, piece by piece, the exact same thing happened. The guards would have been called, the guards would have arrived, or to you would have got wind of it. It would have been broadcast. It would have it would have made uh, the eleven o'clock news, the twelve o'clock news. All the news bulletins in between, it would have made it would, it would have been front page in the papers the next day, and we we all know this. And and when you, when you look at it from that side, that that angers me because you, you realise then RTE, as we already knew, the 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 mainstream uh, newspapers, as we already know, they will only report pro stuff for the government. They don't seem to. I mean, well, they they might report the, the Ray Butler thing, but it'll be twisted. And it'll probably be on some page 16 or somewhere down the back of the paper somewhere. Well, on the actual RTE charter, if you go over and look at it, because I actually downloaded it and I read it, and it actually says in it, and it's quite comical, that they're impartial. And yeah. <laughs> impartiality with the RTE, I don't think me, so. You, you, you sent that back into them. You, you copied yeah. that couple of years back yeah, and yeah. you sent it back into them saying hang on a second you're not reporting you're not giving balanced viewpoints and here's your charter did they ever get back to you no they didn't they're, they're RTE they don't do things like that Let so yeah, Alan what you've done tonight was what you said is great you, you said you invited Ray Butler on to explain his side of the story I just wish like I say that you were straight up like that Ray Butler's side of the story has to be heard you realise that but RTE just seemed to think you know the protesters that were involved that night they didn't try to contact them they didn't uh, bring them on the show, invite them onto the show to get their side of the story. They made no attempt whatsoever. I mean, I try to just argue that, you know, everybody deserves a fair hearing. The protesters' voices need to be heard. I, I was attacked by LMFM, which I think we all know, and I say it to Mike Reid, I wish he'd invite me onto the show, because as all he has on the show, seemingly is, it's the Labour Party show. Because basically Paul Bell and Jed Nash are the most invited guests on that show than anybody else. And I'd ask Mike Reid to invite me on the show and give me the opportunity to talk. And not only, maybe actually leave me off the show, invite Fiona on the show, invite the mother of the 15-year-old girl on the show and give her an hour in the morning to explain how she felt, how that family feels under the constant threat of eviction. To give her the same rights because we're all equal under the law, whether we're a TD or whether we're an ordinary person. Give her the hour to explain how she feels. Facing eviction every day, not knowing from what hour of the day a sheriff is going to arrive at that door and try to evict her. Yeah. That's fair yeah. and balanced reporting. And that's what you did tonight, Alan. You mm. put the invite out to Ray Butler or anybody else who wants to argue that side of the story. Come on, you're free to come uh, on. Yeah. Alan, there's nothing. There's, you see, everybody that's on, that's on this uh, programme tonight will, 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 will understand that there's nothing fair about this country. We had a referendum here in 2012, and the core principle of that referendum was that every child is equal, and every child would be every policy the child would be at the core, uh, the paramount consideration, and all that. Now, where was the consideration for that 15-year-old girl? She was forgotten about. When you have the leader, Enda Kenny, stand up in the dial and come out and say publicly about Ray Buck's side of the story, and not mention the girl or Fiona that was injured. What does that tell you? You then look at RT. How can we expect to get the truth from RT when you have um, Simon Coveney's brother that's um, advisor to the Director General, General on, on, in relation to RT and what the, 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 commercial, or the content of each show goes on. So how can we expect any accountability? How can we expect um, a clear side to come across 
when you have somebody that's a brother to the minister who who actually was the, he brought out the uh, new era document in 2009 and that's where the actual water charges in Irish water started originated from you're 100% so how are you right going to get a fair, a fair hearing on Irish water or anything at all to do with that when the very person who introduced it from day one in 2009 on the new era document his brother is working and advising the director of general of each content of what show content on not the likes of prime time and all these shows. Yeah, it's it's, it's that's where the problem lies. Yeah, political well, appointments in this country. The judges are appointed. Yeah, all the state boards are appointed. You have the disability um, uh, authority. You have social inclusion. You look at all look at all the government boards that are there, state boards that are there. They're all politically appointed. They're mm-hmm. all jobs for the boys. Yeah. So how can the citizen then get any sort of redress? Well, there's no fair justice. Heard? Well, there's no... There's, there's a, absolutely no mm. right of redress in this country at all. That's right. Blatant nepotism right across the board. Now, let's talk about the National Citizens Movement. Obviously, you, you guys have, have... You folks have seen what's going on, and you've, you've, you've obviously said to yourself, enough is enough, something needs to be done. And you've decided to bring the NCM into the uh, political arena and register the group as a political party. Now... Obviously, you're going to have to put together a mandate. People want to know what the mandate is, what, what you plan to do. Can you tell us what your your plans are? I know it's probably early days, but give us an idea what your plans are. It is it, it is early days, Alan. It's a work in progress, right? Okay. But the main thing, what we, if, if anybody looks at the logo, it, the logo more or less speaks for itself. You're talking about the water, you're talking about the leaf, and you're talking about the fire. They're the three elements, and they're, they all represent the assets of the state. Now, since the um, uh, enactment of the Constitution in 1937, you have Article 10. Every con- Constitution is meant to protect the people, but it's only as good as the way, as, and it's only as strong as when it was drafted. So you have De Valera that drafted in 1937. If you look at Article 10, it said state assets. Now, if we're a sovereign people, it should be sovereign assets. Because if they're sovereign assets, assets, you have control over every single thing in this country then. And what we're saying is the assets must best benefit the people of Ireland, not political parties. Because you parties will come and parties will go and governments will come and governments will go. And all they're going to do, to do is use the assets of this state to benefit themselves, either the party interests or personal interests. We've seen it with the oil, we've seen it with the gas, and now we've seen it with Irish water. And our first thing will be to get a referendum on Article 10 and take all these assets back into public control. Mm. I totally it's agree. It's one of the most important things. It's one of the most important referendums this country will ever have. And nationalise the banks. Nationalise the banks. If the, if the banks are nationalised then, you can then go in and all those um, um, properties that are about to be repossessed or, or can't be uh, serviced, you, are, you, you give a write down or you renegotiate the actual at the current market price. Because people think that it's only Joe Black down the road there and it doesn't affect me. It does affect you because if they're out on the, on the side of the road, the banks are after getting recapitalized. So why, are, why have this, this government given them the right to take the homeowner back into court? They're, get, they're getting paid on the double. Because they've already gotten paid for the loans and now they're getting paid, they're, they're taking back the property. So where did the family go? Mm. The family then is out onto the street. Who has to shoulder the burden again? Only the Irish taxpayer. Yeah. And I don't even want to use the phrase taxpayer. I want to say the people of Ireland because everybody is in this together. Yeah, well, totally. And, and what is actually happening as mm. well, Alan, which an awful lot of people don't understand. Once a family goes before the courts, and there have been, it's up to the judge, it's the, the duty of the actual judge to start going on and say, where are the children going to go? Now, if they don't get emergency sh- uh, shelter, there are 600 children in this country in the emergency shelter, as we speak. And if there's no room at the inn, as the saying goes, the HSE has to step in, the state steps, steps in then, and they not only lose their home, they lose their children as well. Mm. Yeah, and, and so you're breaking families. They are trampling on this consti- on our constitution, and they're trampling on it, Alan, because we've sat back and we've allowed them to do it. I totally agree. We have done nothing. Mm. Totally agree. We have allowed them to do it, and the, the water protest for the first time ever have empowered people, and they realise that the actual pe- the power is in the people. All we have to do is get up and say enough is enough. Yeah. Well, and if you've got enough neck, you can get away with anything. I think so. That's what they're after doing. 
I'd, I'd put an... say, the Alan, they're bringing yeah. another concept, which mm. is going to be one of the main platforms that we're going to uh, going to stand on. Is that we want to we want to start a debate in our society about our future in the European Union. Mm. The European exactly. Union, when we were down, when we were down and we were looking for help, the European Union basically kicked us below the belt. That's what they've done to us. And if you remember, Alan, I'm, I'm in my 50s now, when we first joined Europe, and in many of, of the, the different treaties we've had, people were worried. And they were worried about our neutrality being given away. I sat back here a couple of weeks ago, and I heard Charlie Flanagan, our foreign minister, come out and talk about placing more sanctions on Russia because of the Russian war with Ukraine or indirect war at Ukraine. Now, we were always neutral. And people were assured that when they signed up to these European treaties, that that neutrality was never threatened. Now you have our foreign minister coming on world television and European television and endorsing more sanctions against one side or the other. The Russians are no angels, but gee by Jesus, either the Americans. So... We were always neutral, and we were always respected for our neutrality. And what our neutrality gave us, it gave us the insurance that our young people won't be marched out onto any battlefield for anybody, only to defend themselves. That's the only time we should go even consider going onto a battlefield. What we've engaged ourselves in now is a federal Europe, and we have an Irish foreign minister taking sanctions against a superpower. Now, we never signed up for that. Mm. And we look at what the European Union did for us. And we look at democracy within the European Union. You know and I knew, Jordan, all this, when all this blew up in 2008, we have a European Parliament, a very fast, a very well-paid European Parliament, probably even paid more than our TDs. And we have a, lot, a huge bureaucracy over there that costs us as taxpayers millions. And when the, when the crisis happened, what did the European Parliament do? I would suggest to you nothing. We all know that Angela Merkel and Sarkozy first decided everything that was going to happen within Europe. It wasn't within the Democratic Parliament. Now we have Van Rompuy, now we have Barroso, people we've never even got the chance to vote for are dictating what happens in this country. Mm. We've had budgets turning up in the Bundestag and they're deciding what's happened in this country. Now, I think we should have a major debate. And the one thing I hope that will separate us from the rest of the parties that's out there, we are calling for a referendum to leave the European Union. And what we mean by that is, you think about it. We were told when we failed to object to secure the unsecured bondholders as it was. We had a cards in our hand then. We had the deck in our hand. We should have moved and we didn't. And we let the opportunity go. I'd ask to all your listeners out there, if we hold a referendum at the same time as Britain, and then we go to Angela Merkel and I'd say to her, give the Irish people a reason to stay in Europe or else we're out of here. And you might just get an Irish political party like us will contact Syriza, will contact the Spanish party that's going to be elected, that's anti-austerity, that will be elected in December. And we'll ask them to do the same. We want their democracy back for the Irish people, not to be taken over by a bureaucracy in Europe that could sleepwalk us into a third world war. And I'm not exaggerating. I know. I, 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 pay attention. I, to I totally, yeah, I totally agree on, on that. There was, a, there was an article I posted up there on the Facebook, all the way on Facebook page about the 500,000 Irish people to fight in World War Three, which was in the yeah. Daily Mirror or something. But Alan, here's the thing. We've already had a referendum regarding the Lisbon Treaty and they kind of said to us, well, you got it wrong that time, so we're going to ask you again. So why why do you think um, I'll I'll put this to Jamie as well because Jamie's uh, hasn't come in yet. Um, Jamie, why do you think they um, a referendum would work considering they kind of fixed the last one? They ignored our independence and their opinion. 
What, why do you think? Do you think a referendum will work again like what Alan's saying? I think even if it's not accepted in the, the same way that Lisbon 1 wasn't accepted, I think above all else it can be a, a very, very strong symbolic message. Um, to the, to, if nothing else, the, the, the swing voters, those who are sitting on the fence still unsure about the path forward, still unsure about where they even sit themselves. Um, but no, I do think that um, that uh, a referendum will work. I think yes, we do have a government that uh, that are incessant in their own self belief that they can listen to the people, but they prove time and time again that they're unable to do so. Um, but I think that the people themselves, um, above all, us, they they deserve the the forum for their voices to be heard. And you know, every five years is not sufficient enough in my book, and I believe that the guys here will echo the same thing, that every five years is not sufficient for the voices to be heard purely at a, at the ballot box. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, like, I, I don't disagree with a single point that, that Alan has made in relation to the EU. We were burned when we were at our lowest ebb, um, you know, and even now the, the, the same burner has turned around to us and said, well, uh, you didn't really have to make those uh, decisions and uh, really listen to us. And yet we were told we had to take the advice we were being given and all these experts were the only ones who had the, the, the answers and the knowledge to guide us in a path out. And I think that, you know, the, the proof of the pudding has now been realised because we've just had to eat it. And the time for turning a new, our own corner is here, not the corner that, that has been uh, depicted by the government and by the, the, the massively biased uh, RTE and mainstream media. I think that the people themselves are ready to carve that corner. And um, yeah, definitely a referendum is one of the one of those paramount um, methods of doing it. I think that, you know, Ireland also needs to get to a position whereby the people themselves are um, are given back the, 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 the power to, to call a referendum themselves on a, a topic that they so uh, feel the, the, the passion and the desire and the will to do, um, like we had in the earlier constitutions of this country. Um, you know, that, that, that sovereignty that the people have, or, or had really, because in reality, I mean, our sovereignty has been eroded. Um, that, that sovereignty needs to be returned. It's plain and simple. I mean, what has happened... In Ireland's involvement and integration in Europe really has, has I, I think that that's where the bulk of that erosion has taken place. And um, I don't know that the, the pros, over the course of, of what, we're, we're looking at almost five decades now really when you, when you take all things in. I don't think that all things consider that the pros really outweigh the, the, the cons. I don't think Ireland has, has really reaped... Um, all that was promised, uh, but I don't think it, w it has reaped all that that it could, in, even in terms of a fair game from Europe. And um, so I, th I think now the the people's voice, the only method forward is a referendum. Okay. I think so too. Alan, can, I, can I come in there in, in relation to the Lisbon Treaty? One big difference you see in relation to the Lisbon Treaty with us putting forward a, a referendum and Fianna Fáil. Fianna Fáil were the ones that decided we have to do it again in 12 months because they hadn't the courage or the political will to stand up to Europe and say no. They came back with this government and the previous government. We are 1% of the European Union population, yet we're landed with 42% of the European banking debt. Now, that's the deal that these guys went over there. That's the 3,500 euros we're paying to end a penny every week to go over to Europe and come back with his tail between his legs mm. and tell us he got us a great deal. Well, the problem is... Well, as far as I'm concerned mm. and what the National Citizens Movement are saying, mm. we have absolutely nothing to lose but everything to gain. Yeah. By going over to Europe and saying, right, we get into power, we will tell Europe, this is what's happening here, we're putting it before the people. And whatever referendum come in, like it or lump it, it's sticking in the story. Well, the, the problem is, straight away, you is know? that, I think, anyway, Andy Kenny is a school teacher, not a businessman. So that's why he probably has his tail belief between his legs, because he doesn't know how to, how to negotiate. Now, I just want to get Dermot in. Uh, yeah. um, Dermot, tell us the difference between the National Citizens Movement and the likes of DDI and IDP. What's going to be different that you're going to offer the, the electorate, the people? Well, if you look at the core principles of DDI, the National Citizens Movement, and different things like that, everybody, all of these, the hub and all, every one of us want the same thing. We want a better Ireland, you know? Mm. And like Liz was talking about, you, I, I put a post up about three weeks ago on my page. I mean, you probably remember, I think you commented on it yourself. 
And it was just a simple post. Do you think we should remain in Europe? Mm. And within four or five hours, I had five or six hundred people reply, no, out of Europe. And only one person said, yeah, but he wanted to keep the top punt. I wanted to stay in Europe and get the punt back. But that's a, that's a huge margin. Like, every person that had said, yes, they want out of Europe, you know. They've done absolutely nothing for us. Absolutely none. And just the other night here, there was three politicians up in Cavan. Uh, Fianna Gael, Sinn Féin, and another Fianna Fáil. And they were, the three of them were asked the question, if the bond holder bailer happened now, would they say okay? And the three of them said no. And then the man in the audience said to them, w w did you feel it was right down at the time? And they said no, they shouldn't have done it at the time. So at that time, I was outside the Dáil, you probably remember, I was outside the Dáil that night of the bailout, mm -hmm. and we had a petition for the president not to sign the bailout, because we had all the figures. If they had, we, we, I have a list of all the bondholders, there's over 400 bondholders, and 66% of them are Germans and Dutch and French, and that's who we bailed out, all different bondholders. Now, the, when we got our figures at that time, if we had to burn the bondholders, <clears throat> each of them, bondholders, would have only lost 3% of their capital. That's all. So my question today is to take the same question to the politicians and say, have a look at the bondholders now, do a survey, let's see how much they're going to lose if we burn them, and if they're only going to lose 3% of their earnings or their capital, whatever it is, or whatever they have, let's burn them. Let's, just, let's burn them now. Because all the politicians are admitting now that what we were doing outside the doll that night was correct, that we, got, we had got it right, the people that was outside that gate. Mm. But you see, at the time, we didn't, people weren't awake enough but now, because of the water protest, people are starting to ask a lot of questions. And now they're starting to ask about the bondholder debt and this different things, and the fishing grounds especially. We've given over $204 billion in fish revenue to Europe since we joined the EU. We've got nothing back. We have fishing boats all around Ireland, parked up in the harbours, and there's super trawlers coming in Japan, massive big ships, and they're sucking and raping our waters, and we're getting absolutely nothing from it. It's, so it's, that's another thing that would be on the mm. national citizen would be to take back our fishing grounds and tell these foreign boats to get the fuck out of our waters, you know. Okay. We, we, we sorry, tried. sorry about that. Forget uh, I know. It's, it, it's very emotional because it, the way things are passion, going, it upsets. Yeah. It's passion. And it, it, we do get upset. And I'm no different than either, Steve. Steve, you have a question there for the, for the folks. Yeah, just, the just Dermot, I mean, what, what do you reckon? Uh, let's, say, let's say, for argument's sake, we did have a, a referendum. And, I mean, well, just say, uh, Joan, I think she's correct in, my, in what she said. She said, RTE are the enemy of the people of this country. And while they exist, all referenda will always come down on the side of the mainstream government. And I, I would tend to agree with that. But if there was a referendum, and let's say that uh, the majority of people had woken up and decided, yes, we need to get off this this uh, this boat, this ship that, that is the EU, and just be self-sufficient... I mean, if we were to do that, what do you think would happen? I mean, what, would, 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 would other countries impose, the, would, could they put sanctions on us? Or, you know, what, what would happen to us? Let, if, we, if we got out in the morning, what do you think would, would happen? Would it be, would it be bad stuff? And, you know? Well, the first thing what would happen, if we said we wanted a referendum, we would have the usual RTE spin, and the government said, oh, there'll be no cash left in the machines, there'll be nothing left. Look around yourselves, the people are not blind. People that went down to Killarney yesterday, have a look at the fields lying idle. There's absolutely nothing happening in the fields. They're just lying barren. You have the farmers, that's the really Fine Gael rich farmers, they get 100,000 a year, 120,000 each, for sitting on their land from the, from the cap system in Europe. The poorer farmers get 10 grand a week. That's how they get 10,000 euro a week. Or, sorry, a year. 10,000 and 100 a year from the cap system, you know? Yeah. You have the fishing grounds. You have the oil. We have more oil in Ireland. Don't mind the lies that they're spinning out. The oil companies here in Ireland made one billion in profit last year. One billion they made in profit. And that went all over to Norway. And they get the oil. And they have a lot more oil than that. And they've got the gas, they've got the oil, they've got the fishing grounds. This country could be the, one of the richest countries in the world. The only thing we have is bad managers. We've got bad managers running it, you know. They gave away the fishing grounds, the oil, the gas for absolutely nothing. And we could be self-sufficient in no time, you know. It'll take a little bit of work a couple of years to get going. We get our own people taking the oil out of the ground, get rid of these multinational companies. They get our own people doing it. I mean, all the oil companies in the world, they get their machine heads from, from taking their oil out of the ground in America from Cork. They have a company in Cork that make the, the, the drill bits, you know. So why can't we take the oil out of our own grounds? But then again, you don't really have to take the oil out because once you know you have the oil there, you can barter with that, you know. 
If okay. you're part of one England say, listen, we supply one oil for the next 20 years at X amount, that brings in a huge revenue, you know. And the next thing is to get these ex-ministers' pensions. I mean, I have the figures here for John Borton. When she retires now, probably this year, she's going to get a termination pension of 14000 She's going to get termination payments of 54000 a TD salary lump sum of 130000 an annual TD pension of 43000 a tarnished administrative pension of 42000 and it all totals up to 2569000 That's what she's going to get. And Pat Bravo will get 40000 less than that. Well, that's can, what we have to get rid of. Well, can, 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 can I come in there as well, pensions? Alan? Because these, 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 these actual core principles are just coming into my mind as, I'm spe- as we're speaking. In relation to the ministerial pensions and stuff like that, right? Remember we had a referendum on the, job, the, on the judges' renumeration? Yeah. 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 Okay. We will be having a referendum in relation to the actual ministerial pensions as well. Now, why exactly. should the likes of Bertie Ahern and why should the likes of Brian Cowan get 150,000 pension a week and he's working for Topaz? You get your pension when you're 65, like everybody else, yeah. unless you're, if you're not working, when you retire. Yeah, well, the, the, the it's issue is there. The, it's one system for them, one system for us. But here's the but thing. There is one system for them. You're, mm. Let's put it to perspective here, Alan, right? Mm. You're talking about Enda Kenny on three and a half grand a week, okay? Mm. Yeah. That's 20 that's actually 20 times more than a person on welfare is getting. Yeah. No, well, look, I, 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 I totally agree. But here's, you know? the, here's, the, here's the problem, and I put this to the group. The problem is this. You have a 1% of elite people at the top of the food chain, the golden circle, right? And they're making the, the overall wealth of the world. The rich have got richer and the poor have got poorer. And this is the statistic coming in. And you have the golden circle, the 1% in Ireland who are making a lot of money. They're not going to change the system to benefit the people lower down the food chain because they like it the way it is. They like things. They like themselves getting richer and they like the poor getting uh, getting poorer because they're getting more wealth from the poor getting poorer. So they will do their damnedest to not make a change or may not make a change in the system. And this is what you're faced against. So what's your proposal? What can we do about it? Well, the thing about it is, that, well, look... Go down to Ballyhay today. People have to, in their own community, take responsibility and not register to vote and not voting and, and coming out of the, the whole political system. That's playing right into their hands because if you ever heard, you'll ever hear RT or, or TV3, they'll be saying coming up to the election, they're hoping for it to be bad weather because the party faithful will come out. They'll get the machine up and running because it is a party machine. As, as Alan said to me one evening, and he sat down and he he nailed it when he said this, right? A political party is a business. Yeah, it is. And everything they can spin off that. When you sit down and think about it, and Alan will explain it to you, and come in and explain it to you better than I would. He is 100% on the ball there. Because why do you think they have all these state boards, okay? Why do you think they have all these, um, all their own cronies put onto these boards? Because they're going to call in the favours come election time. Mm. And they go out the political machine and they'll go through hail, rain and snow. Because why? It benefits each one, each and every one of them because they'll be reappointed again. Yeah. Uh, I, I have heard this on occasion you know? from people saying that I'm not going to bother to vote. But the way I see voting is it's like a bullet in a gun. Right into the, the, the more bullets you have, the more chance you have of hitting something. And the problem is, is that Absolutely. the people who say that, well, I'm not going to vote, well, then don't complain about the system that we're in. Because, look, if all we have is our vote, then we should use it because our forefathers died to give us that. So I think our respect for them anyway. And if that's all we have, we should use it. But we should try and keep an eye on things. But, Alan, you come in there. Do you want to talk about that? Do you know the message that I get out to people? Sorry, Alan, just on the actual voting thing, right? I said, look, use it as a protest vote. Yeah, totally, yeah. Vote them out. Yeah, vote them out. Use it as a protest vote if nothing else. Come out and vote these guys out. Yeah, t- totally. Alan, you know do you want to come in on that? that? Yeah, um, Alan, look what they said about a business. So I was actually calling it an industry. Yeah. Because it is a political industry. And there's so much money to be made off it. You, you went through it yourself with the political advisors mm. and the amount of money they get. And, and you're going up to, you, I think, the top rate of pay there you mentioned for one of Andy Kenny's uh, political advisors was something in the region of €150,000. Now, do you remember back before they cut child benefits, before they cut old age pensions, phone allowances, before they cut children's medical cards, before they introduced the universal social charges, before they cut public servants' pay by about 25%, 
they've already cut back on charities, the likes of the, the Simon community and Focus Ireland by about 30%. They actually said they were going to cap their advisors' pay. And I think they, they set the rate somewhere in the 90s. Now, Alan, if me and you earned somewhere in the 90,000s per year, we'd be thrilled with ourselves. We'd be absolutely thrilled. And what they did, they said they'd cap them. And they broke them caps nearly almost immediately. The same as way as they lied about everything else. And now look at you You quoted 150,000. I'm telling you it's a fact. They said they wouldn't pay their advisors over 92,000. Now that to me is something like a 50% rise. That's a 50% rise when they're taking medical cards off terminally ill children. They're giving their advisors a 50% rise. Now, that's buying them favours. And that's what this is all about. And you're looking at some of the political parties having political appointees on top of charitable boards. And we know all about that. We know all about that with Paul Coyley. We know all about that with Frank Flannery of Fianna Gael and Paul Coyley of Fianna Fáil. They were put on in charge of, of charitable boards. And Paul Coyley walked off now... There's the rehab, I don't want to mention the wrong charity to ruin anybody, but Paul Coyley walked off at 750000 of a of a pension package. He walked off into the sunset. That was half the takers of the charity he worked off for the year. He was a Fianna Fáil appointee again. Frank Flannery, the election supervisor, I think, of Fianna Gael before the last election, paid himself exorbitant amounts of money, again, with another charity. And nearly basically the two of them ruined a decent charity. It was the rehab as one of them. Mm. And the CRC was the other. Now the rehab is a very important charity. And the Central Median Clinic as well is an important charity. Them two people gave a good charity a bad name because of their naked greed. And it really sticks in people's throats. Frank Flannery now is seemingly being asked back to advise then the Kenny after loading his pockets with charity his money. Mm. And that's, again, it's another industry. They're allowed, there's no questions asked when they get involved in anything. And Liz will tell you about these voluntary boards. You know yourself about FOSS. Mm. And yeah. the trade unionists were bought off of FOSS because yeah. Des Geraghty, ex-leader of SIP2, was on the board of FOSS. He enjoyed his tickets to the rugby matches. He enjoyed his tickets to the O2. He enjoyed his tickets to the soccer matches. He never bothered to do the job he was he was there to do in the first place. Supposed to be looked after the unemployed. It wasted billions of taxpayers' money. Mm. And this is what all these boards do. And this is what we mean about industry. So when Ender looks for support, he's going to get it because he's paying for it, and he's paying for it with taxpayers' money. Yeah, We're because allowing it's... with taxpayers' money. Because these people are. It's not his money. Well, here's Can the I? here's the thing. Just mention something, Liz, on what Alan just said there. I've seen this in the corporate world, and this is this is basically what happens, obviously, in, in the political system as well. Because as you said, Alan, it's a business. I've seen people start off on down the bottom of the bottom of the ladder, and they get a little bit of promotion, they get a bit more money, and they have a little bit of promotion, a bit more money. And um, a few years down the line, they have the little own little empire. They have the nice salary with the company car and the credit card and now they've become complete morons and uh, self-centered and controlling and everything else because they're protecting their empire and unfortunately power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely and and this is what you have to be careful with people who are not used to being in a position and you get it with little um i've seen it with little uh, committees where you have your little Hitlers on the committee who want to dictate and control everything, even local, local uh, estates, community boards. You know, the the power trip goes to people's heads, and you have to laugh at it. You know, um. So how how would you deal with that? And what's your approach to that kind of, you know, with people? Do you do vetting, or are you going to watch out for that? Well, what's going to happen? Well, basically, what, but look, there's two types of, of, of politician, right? There's those that want to do something, and there's those that want to be something. We want to do something. There is a difference. But let me go back to what you were saying earlier on in your crank or whatever, which a lot of people are, 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 don't realize, okay? You look at the housing situation in Ireland at the moment, okay? We have 90,000 people on the housing list. 
we have a homeless uh, crisis. Uh, we had the shelters open at Christmas that apparently are going to be closed now. Now, you go on the website, Alan, during the week now, and you check this out for yourself, and you go on the Irish Society for Customer Social Housing. We have a guess how many voluntary housing bodies are set up in Ireland. I wouldn't even try. Probably 20, I don't know, 20? There's over 240. Wow, most well. Right? Now, each of those have to be funded. So who's funded them? funding them? Only the public. Now, that is to allocate social housing. Now, then you go back to the councils, right? And in, in each council in Ireland, you have what's called a director of services responsible for housing. Now, each one of them are on a salary of 90000 a year. And that's the public social housing sector in this country. That's where the money is going. Mm. So you have your 31 or 32 councils, because there's four of them in Dublin, I think. There's two in Galway and there's two in Cork. So multiply that by 90,000. That's before you ever allocate a house. That's before you ever put a, a block, lay down a foundation for another house. And then you look at on top of that again, the voluntary housing bodies. All these voluntary housing bodies, a lot of them, what they're doing is they're allocating the unfold, unsold affordable housing. Mm. And they're have a two t- uh, what they're basically stating is, right, they're giving priority to people in working over housing need. That's what's going on here. Five years I'm, I'm writing into the Minister for Environment to draw his attention to this. And that's another reason why I sat back and I said the, the likes of the National Citizens Movement have to be set up. Because there is absolutely no accountability whatsoever. Governments come and governments go, but the civil servants stay the same. You're still dealing with the same civil servants. Yeah, well, I, I'd like to call them the civil you know? ser- serpents. Steve, you have a question there. Yeah, I've got a question from Jimmy. Uh, thanks, Jimmy, uh, on People's Internet Radio. And Jimmy, this is a question, obviously, for, for all, all the, 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 the group here this evening. Uh, how are potential candidates going to deal with threats from the IMF, the Crown, the EU? If you do get, let's say there is an election, you do get into power, and we're, we're going to maybe give two fingers to Europe, how would you deal, uh, all four of you, with any threats from, from, the, well, from the EU or the IMF? Well, I'd like well to put it this way, though. Sorry, if it... Yeah, go on, Alan, go on, sorry. I'd like to take, what, looking at the situation, uh, the way the IMF, the way the Troika has treated different countries um, all through this process, what they do is they circle the wagons, they separate you from everybody. They put out this information. We heard about the lazy Greeks. The Greeks don't pay tax. They don't like paying tax. We vilify them. We, we, we attack them and we circle like they did the Sharia. Jesus, Sharia just got in the power. He circled like and he isolated them. And that's what he did. Now, to me, how do you deal with that when the European Union as a very powerful body starts to then come down as you as a small little country like us? Now, what I'd be doing as a small little country like us, I would have to ring up the Greek people. I'd ring up the leader of Syriza. And I say, look, lads, this has happened to you before. And the reason why it worked is because no one came to your aid. Now, we need to get an anti-austerity alliance across the whole of Europe. Spain is coming, Alan. Spain is going to come back in December. Mm. And the other, I, I probably pronounced the name of the party wrong. I think it's Padloma. Will be Padloma. elected. Thanks, Dermot. And they're going to be elected in December. I would be, uh, I'd be ringing them up and saying, look, lads, Spain on its own can't take on the other bloc. But Spain, Ireland, Greece, Portugal, Italy, together, countries that's known as, unfortunately, whoever dictated the name, as the pigs of Europe, as they tried to cause, we need to act together. We need to threaten the Germans' economy. We need to make sure, as a trade unionist, there's a, 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 an organization in Europe called the International Labour Organization. And I was always wondering, the International Labour Organization has affiliated unions through all the countries. Like, ICTA would be affiliated to it. Not that they're much use under David Fagner, my ad. But anyway, again, we had general strikes in Greece and the Greek people going out on their own. Why cannot we bring up the different unions in each country and ask the Italians, the Spanish, the German, or sorry, the Irish, to ground all the Lufthansa flights, to not let a Mercedes car be taken off a ferry during the strike we're going to have. And we're saying to the Germans, look, you can threaten us, but we'll hit back. And we need to act together 
within Europe. It's solidarity with each other, mm. with fellow countries. Because, like I say, as far as I'm aware, I'm listening, that the rate of suicide in Greece is six people a week. It's six people either a week or a day. Okay, now, okay. six people a day are committing suicide. Now, that's the acceptable collateral damage as far as governments are concerned. They're accepting that because they won't give them a write down. There's plenty of room, there's plenty of financial room to give the Greek people a write down. Again, when you face the economic argument, even in our own country, we're always told the left or someone like us, we deal in fantasy, fantasy politics. We're not dealing with reality. But let's bring us back a little peg. If you remember, Alan, and I'm sure you do because you're politically aware. Yeah. If you remember the European Union recapitalized our banks to the tune of something like 27 billion. Mm. And it was told to us at the time that that was actually to deal with mortgage distress. Yeah. Now, at the time as well, mortgage distress was told to us it totaled around 94 billion. Now, in simple terms, in simple terms, we were told then the Irish banks had the money to knock off a third off of people's mortgage debt across the board. They had the money. The money was in the banks. That's not fantasy econo- economics, Alan. That's actually reality. Mm. But the banks, what did they choose to do? After we bailed them out, they chose to keep them on their balance sheet. They chose not to use them for mortgage distress. Mm. Now, I'm not saying to you, Alan, and again dealing with reality, that everyone would deserve a tour. But we had the capability of knocking up to a third off people who were in genuine distress. Yeah. We could knock a third off. And just maybe, Alan, we could bring them people back from the brink. We could bring them people into a situation where they become economically viable again, where they become productive citizens again, where they're able to bring their families out for a meal at the weekend or bring them to the cinema. We had the capacity to do that, but we chose not to. The banks chose not to. The government chose to let them away with it. So, to handle Europe, we need to look for friends. We need to contact the Greeks, contact the Spanish, contact the Portuguese. They're in the same boat. We're hoping that people in Portugal, like people in Spain, will follow suit. And the danger is, and it was, it was said down at the Ballyhay talk after the march today, what people don't realise, Alan, the danger is when people lose faith in democracy, we have hundreds of thousands of people out in the streets saying you don't want border charges. The government are ignoring them. And people start to then look elsewhere when they lose faith in democracy. And what the people are facing in Greece, if they don't deal, Syriza is a democratically elected government with the full support of the ordinary person on the streets of Greece. And they're asking to do a debt deal. They're trying to do it business-like. And it looks like the European Union are going to ignore them. The danger is the people that chose to make a democratic choice and vote for Syriza will now vote for parties, Nazi parties, like Golden Dawn. Well, unless Syriza actually and go and negotiate with Russia and China, because my understanding, and I, I don't know how true this is, but my understanding looking between the lines is that they are going to arrange to have a, a plan B with Russia and China for financing Greece if they don't, if the IMF doesn't play ball. So they have the best of both worlds. So they have plan B. So maybe that's their, maybe that's their plan. That's why they probably needed a bit of breathing space to get that time to negotiate with Russia and China. I mean, that's only me having a look at what's going on. I hope you're right, Alan. I hope you're right. I'd like to see them have an option. And, uh, you know, ma- and maybe we can do that. I mean, we can, you know, we can cut ourselves away from Europe and still have trade, trading between Europe. And then if the IMF start getting funny, we'll speak to Russia and China and join the BRICS countries and move away from the IMF. That's why BRICS was set up in the first place. Because they, they got fed up of the IMF controlling everything. So the BRICS countries got together and more and more countries are joining the BRICS. And then the Kenny and his cohorts are just stuck in the, I don't know, they're just stuck in the Middle Ages because they're not realising what's going on globally. And they're sticking, they're keeping the di- this loyalty to Europe for some reason. While Russia and all the other countries are joining the BRICS, moving away from the IMF. It's, it's not even that, Alan. If Enda Kenny had a rolled up his sleeve, 
and and Eamon Gilmore had a rolled up their sleeves. If they, they genuinely went to Europe to negotiate, if they, they played hardball, if they, they tried their best and got something off, maybe not everything, got something off, mm-hmm. then we'd say, well, OK, we didn't get everything, but they did try. But you know and I know, Alan, they didn't even try. They mm-hmm. didn't even ask. No. No. And the Kenny constantly avoid an answer in that action. And you know, Alan, the, uh, Alan, the scare, the, the, the scaremongering and propaganda that's going to um, come out now is that we need Europe and we need them. And what do we need them for? We don't need them at all. No, our biggest all. trading partners are our friends across the road, the water there, um, England. Okay. Yeah. You have there's a whole new market after opening it up in China and in America in relation to our beef. We're the only European country that our beef is still going to taste as good as it does today. As, uh, next week. Yeah, now Talkie, we have a so, question come in there, Steve. Yeah, uh, this one came in from Chris, and just, just speaking of, you know, how would we would we get on, like if if we if we walk away? And Chris is wondering, can you ask the panel where will we get funding from if we tell the Troika to <coughs> take a take a run and jump? He says he does understand it's all fake money and all, but you know, where, where, what position would that leave us in? One of our assets, we funds our resources worth. Brimming in resources. We've got fish, we've got the farm, we've got gas, we've got oil. That's where the strike is getting all the money from. They come on and write that on for our resources. Take the resources back and we have something to barter with, you know? Mm. What about printing our own money? Position. We're in a better position at the moment because the simple reason is, look, we're after recapitalizing our banks. True. So, I yeah. mean, we have enough. We, we and, and as well as that, if we go back even to the punt and pull out of the euro completely... You start printing your own money. Okay, it might start off and it won't be as valuable. You'll have to bring up the currency or the actual value of it again. But um, we'll be what, with we'll be what they always say we are, Liz. We'd be more competitive because we'd have control over our own currency. Exactly. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Oh, well, I yeah. to- totally agree with you. I think that's that's the way we're going to go. We have about 10 minutes left, so do you want to kind of give us um, a bit of promo about the National Citizens Movement? I'll tell you, Alan, what? can I just mention, yeah. because I think it's, it's very relevant, and I, I just want to mention before you go, and I know... The show went all over the place. It's very hard to, 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 to plan the night. I just want to mention uh, the five guys who are locked up in prison. Of course, yeah. Four people that's locked up in prison. Yeah. And I just want to bring people's attention to it. And, and of course, the term political policing is going around. And I just want to remind people, we take Tala, right? We know that people were arrested um, in dawn raids in Tala over the John Burton protest. Now, they're probably going to face the courts and could face prison like our colleagues in prison now at the moment. And i just like people to listen. We accuse them of political police. And I, I direct this. Uh, I, I served in the Garda there for four years. And what you're told when call comes in, prioritise. That's what you do. You're prioritise. Now, I just like to direct this question to this chief superintendent in Tala Garda Station. What he did, the prison service were transporting a very dangerous prisoner. They asked for an escort. They were transporting him to Tala Hospital. So I'd imagine that that re- request went to Tala Garda Station. They asked for an escort. This was a dangerous criminal. He was violent. And he was a flight risk because he escaped from a British prison before. They were refused. They got zero guards to help the prison service transport this prisoner to hospital. What happened? Two prison officers were injured. One, seriously. Members of the public could have been killed. That was a decision taken by a chief superintendent in Tala. That same chief superintendent decided to send 10 Gardaí to a harmless 16-year-old's door at 7 o'clock in the morning to arrest them. Now, if that's not political policing, I'd like... I'd like to invite that chief superintendent from Tala to come on your program and explain to the public why he left the public at risk when it came to a dangerous criminal and treated an innocent, harmless 16-year-old boy like a major criminal by sending 10 Gardaí, nine of them detectives, to arrest him that morning. We know we're living in a state that's actually using the police to intimidate protesters. And that's what they're doing. And I'd like to send me solidarity to the four people in prison that shouldn't be there, that shouldn't be there tonight, because the police 
and the government are using political policing to intimidate protesters. And that's the message I'd like to give our solidarity with the four people that's locked up tonight. Yeah, same here. No, that's great. Yeah. How, how do we wake up the Gardaí? Because I, I feel the Gardaí are the people who are stopping us from ch- making a change in this country because the, the politicians are using the Gardaí as their own personal security service for their own means. the people means. in charge of the Gardaí. It's not the guards well, themselves, it's the uh, people in charge. Can I come out? So I was outside Cork um, just a court there recently because there's another protester uh, up before the Corks, uh, up before the courts for damage, damage in metres. And there was a large guard of presence there. It was just unbelievable to see it, you know. And basically what we, we were being interviewed and what I was saying is, look, I'm pleading the National Citizens Movement, we're pleading to the Gardaí, stand on the side of the people. Remember your constitutional oath. You swore to uphold the Constitution and your job isn't to act as a security firm for the likes of Dennis O'Brien. Stand with the people like they did in Italy and the thing about it is, like, if you're going to be going around, community policing has been damaged and it has been brought to an all-time low. At what expense? Mm. Well, we talk and about... Who's to, who's to gain for this? Because we're all mm. going to lose in the long run here. Yeah. Well, you we, know, we, we talk 90, about... 90% of the Gardaí did not sign up for this, Alan. No they one... They don't want to be part of this. I, you know? I totally agree. Well, here's the thing. I looked into this Nuremberg excuse, what they talk about, the Nuremberg excuse. And basically, if, if a guardie is told to do something by a superior that goes against the law of the land, well, they're held yeah. accountable. It's like Steve turning around to me and going, Alan, go over there to that person and kill them. Who's responsible, me or Steve? I'm going to be responsible. And the guardie have to realise that just because their superior says they have to do it, if that goes against the law of the land, well, they're accountable. Um, just following orders. Where do, just following orders, Alan. Where did we hear that before? Yeah, but the, the, that's what I'm saying. That that doesn't wash, yeah, and it didn't you know? in in war, after it World it War Two. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't wash. No, uh, bro, the, as, as protesters go, Alan. Right. As protesters go, we've been vilified on RTE. We've been vilified on News Talk and LMFM. And I'd just like to remind everybody. I'd say to please people sitting at home. Look at the people in Greece. There was riots on the street even this week where there was petrol bombs thrown at, at the police. There was buildings burned, cars burned. I'd like to remind people that sitting at home, there was during the poll tax in England, what brought down Margaret Thatcher's government, there was a poll tax protest in London in, I think it was 1990. There was 143 people injured at that protest. 43 of them were police, right? That was at a violent protest. There's been violent protests in Spain. There's been violent protests in Greece and in Italy. Even though in one instance, like Liz say, the guards took their helmets off and walked away. They wouldn't actually charge the crowd. Now, actually, when you think of it, what have our protesters did? They threw a water balloon. They sat down on the road and they called the president names. And we've been vilified on the street. Vilified. There hasn't been one protest or charge, as far as I know, with assault on anybody. They haven't thrown one projectile. They haven't thrown one petrol bomb. They haven't assaulted anybody that I know of, because I don't know of an assault case up in court. And I'd like any politician that's given out back there, please can he point out of an assault case that he can point where the protester assaulted someone. I haven't heard of it. I've heard the other side. And as you know, the worst incident on the Joan Borton weekend when she was trapped there for two hours, was a young girl, Fiona Healy, was thrown violently against a steel pillar by a member of the guards. Very, very clearly on YouTube. Now, that girl could have went into that steel bar with her head. Now, whether he wears a uniform or not, that was the most violent incident that weekend. And we heard nothing more about that. We've heard nothing more about a guard facing charges about that. It's a yeah no I totally agree I totally agree and we it's just all about waking waking people up and hopefully waking up the guardy as well we have that uh, five minutes so do you, do you want to we we'll just do a round robin just give us uh, your own take on uh, the citizens the uh, national citizens movement and we'll go around the table then we'll we'll take a, we'll, we'll finish up on that yeah we want to go first sorry I just want to let you know we we are actually ha- having an issue with the Skype and you are going to hear the dial tone there now. 
that's just ringing Liz back. I think Hello. Liz, okay, Liz just right. got disconnected. Oh, we got Liz got disconnected. Okay, so the we battery, have the battery went on the phone. My apologies. That's okay. So we have five minutes left. So a, qu- a quick sum up from everybody in the uh, around the table on uh, the the movement on the way forward. Well, well, <coughs> well we will. We will do what we started out. We said we'd bring about accountability. We've, we've proven that. We've taken two cases so far, and we're going to take another couple of cases too. So we will go after them, the politicians and anybody that's unaccountable here. But that's our plan, like you know. Okay, Alan. Well, basically, um, we started actually on your show. So thanks very much, first of all, for Alan for introducing me to Liz, and I already knew Dermot, but bringing the three of us together that was great. Now what we have to do is we've came alive and went on fire online and we need to hold that fire and put boots on the ground now. And that's what me and Liz have been doing over the last two or three months. We've been going around the country. We've been meeting with different groups of people. We've been turning the Facebook warriors into street protesters. And now we're going to turn them street protesters into a movement that we will hope will make a difference when it comes to the next election. We will give people a choice. And the choice would be, vote for the parties that's inflicted this damage on your economy, on your families, that's forced them into emigration, into high unemployment. And let's be honest about it, and Liz has said this before, the politicians in this country have blood on their hands. And I'm not lying, I'm not exaggerating. We know the suicide statistics are through the roof. We know some of them 100,000 families that the Land League and Fairness are sticking up for are suffering tonight. They are suffering tonight because they're under tremendous stress and this state is abandoning them. The National Citizen Movement or the Land League and the likes of us, we will not abandon them. We will hope to turn ourselves into a political force to be reckoned with before the next election. Okay, and uh, Liz? Well, basically, whatever we, the, the message that I want to get across here is you look at the definition of a political um, group of people, it's party. And they, that's exactly what they're after doing, Alan, they've partied. Mm. We're here to serve, we are not here to party. It's as simple as that. Okay. We will do a job because it's in our best interest. One of the main reasons that I, that I got involved and started this off, I'm 49 years of age, I didn't want to be in my 60s or 70s, God forbid, whatever length of time I'm, I'm on this earth, right? And have my grandchildren coming along and say to me, were well, you all asleep when this was going on? Yeah. Look what we have inherited because ye were asleep at the wheel. Yeah. I told and we you. have to take responsibility for this. We can't be blaming the politicians anymore now. Yeah. We've got to take back our power, take back our control, and take back our country for our children's future. And that's basically what it boils down to. Totally agree. Jamie. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you wake up. Yeah, no, J- uh, J- Jamie just sent us a message there earlier. He had to go. Okay. I think he just went. He slipped out, out quietly there a couple of minutes ago, but he had uh, something that he had he needed to do. Okay, no problem at all. Okay, well that kind of sums it up there. And I totally agree with you, Liz, on your last uh, statement there. Um, we have to wake up. I mean, the likes of the Ray Butlers and all the politicians there, when their kids turn around, if they're suffering, and say, "What were you doing when Ireland was going through this mess? What did you do to help Dad or Granddad?" It, it'd be nice to turn around and say, "Well, I was doing X, Y, and Z." But I can see Ray Butler's kids or the other politicians' kids going, what did you do? Well, I was cutting ribbons and opening up flower shops and actually we're, we didn't help anybody. Oh, we thought we were helping. Oh, we have a, a quick phone call. We'll, uh, we'll, let's, let's see what we can do. Uh, don't forget the protest for Saturday RTE. Okay, o'clock. we'll do that now. We just have a, 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 we have a phone, uh, somebody phoning in. Yeah, the caller, um, what's your name and uh, do you have a question? Yeah, that's all that I have a question. I just want to say, uh, well done on the brilliant speeches tonight. I'm really enjoying the show. Oh, brilliant. And I think they're all brilliant. Brilliant stuff. Well, thanks. Thanks for I'd your I'd recognise that voice anywhere. Would you? <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you very much, Phil. And I have to say, it's really held in my attention. I'm so thankful to one and all. Thank you very much. And definitely behind them all the way. Brilliant Thank stuff. You. Great, thanks for your call. All right, take care. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah, I recognise that voice anywhere. Yeah. Uh, she's been at she's been at all the water protests as well and she, she kind of she she got a little bit famous at the last one when they were singing um oh what was it? Um oh, what's the song? The song uh, Jailhouse Rock. 
Yeah, if I was looking at the jailhouse rock, you'll see her in the right hand corner. I think she's wearing a kind of a blue jacket. <laughs> really nice so, yeah. so, you, so you want to mention uh, something going on there in RTE? Tell us that quickly. Yeah, there. Well, we're having a protest on Saturday at uh, two, two, p- two, uh, 2 p.m. in the afternoon at RTE. And it's very important because the last time we went up, Alan was there, well, Alan was there with me. There wasn't a lot turned up, only 40 people. My dear, it was minus five degrees. It was very cold. But this time, there is a lot coming. So far, there's 1,400 on the page, you know. So I hope to get a lot more people there because it's very important because RTA has given out all misinformation, telling lies about us, about everything, you know. It's important to get there, bring our posters and make a big protest there with this one, you know. Brilliant stuff. Okay, guys, listen, thanks a lot for coming on. Much appreciated. We're just going to go off to uh, a musical break. Actually, before we uh, before we go, Steve, do you do the honours uh, contact details? Please. Yeah, before we, we go to the to the music, um, I will just say, wh- whoever wants to take it, just give us the contact details uh, for, so we can get it up on the chat room there and also up on the website as well if people want to find out more about the National Citizens Movement or if they want to join. Well, the National Citizen Movement is on Facebook. If you just type it in the top bar, you know. Yeah. And you, you can get it at that way. Just get to the name page. Uh, you can private messages. Uh, my my mobile number is oh eight five one seven five seven two one six. Anyone's free to ring me any time. Um, don't yeah, don't, don't, don't say any time, Alan. <laughs> you don't say any time. Do you have a website planned, or what? Are you what are you going to do about that? Yeah, that's, we have, that's in the making, all right. We're just nearly ready now. We're ready in the next couple of weeks. Brilliant stuff. Okay, well, listen, keep us posted and let us know so we can give a give a plug to that. Just stay with us there for a minute, guys. We're going to go off to a musical right. break and we'll be back after this. This is Open Your Mind Radio on OYMRadio.com, UnitedWeStrike.com and PeoplesInternetRadio.com. And we're back. Yes, uh, Brothers in Arms, uh, Villa Dire Straits. I was going to just pick something cheesy, but I, I said, you know what? Don't just pick something from Alan's uh, 45 collection. <laughs> just pick something suitable for, you know, everyone who's on this evening. And I think that was that, that was fairly suitable. Brothers in Arms. We'll have to get more. I'll have to, up to, up to de- update uh, my collection, I think. Um, brilliant interview. Great people. Dermot. I've met Dermot and Alan. Have met Liz. Have met J- Jamie. But I'm sure in the travels... Of what we do, we'll probably meet up with them along the way, some maybe peaceful assembly somewhere down in Trim, Mullingar or something like that, and we catch up with them. Um, but brilliant what they're doing, they have loads of support. Again, more political parties are needed to fight the system. And that's what we need to do, because in, it's people power, we need to get together. We need to stop looking for the answer outside. The answer is with us, and we need to get up off our butts and start doing things. That's what we need to do now. I did post up something on my Facebook page during the week and um, it again I talk about, people who have heard the show before, we talk about the whole 33% thing and basically I just put up saying 33% of people care about what's going on in Ireland, 33% of people don't care about what's going on in Ireland or don't want to have no interest in it, I'm okay Jax and then 33% of people are sitting on the fence. The people that are sitting on the fence are the people we need to wake up because if we have 66% of Irish people fighting for a better Ireland, well then we're going to get there. That's what we need to do. The 33% that don't care will never care because they're probably the people who are, I'm okay Jack, I'm probably part of the, the cabal or the elite or whatever you want, whatever what way you want to look at it or whatever name you want to give them. So that's what we really need to do. But uh, great information, great uh, a great group of people, and um, brilliant to to have them on. Now that uh, offer still stands for Ray Butler. If he wants to come on the show and give us his point of view, uh, there's no problem doing that. We'll have here his his say, and and he can tell us what what happened and what went on. It's only fair being, you know, in the media that we offer both sides of the story, unlike some mainstream media channels that we have mentioned in this uh, interview tonight. But um, so who's on with Vince, Steve? Uh, I'm glad you asked that. I actually, I actually know that information. Believe it or believe it or not, uh, Vin was was quite kind enough to post it on the chat there earlier. Chris Fogarty is going to be guest, uh, Vin's guest this evening as soon as we clear. And Mick from uh, Liffy Sound uh, FM. Uh, it's, and that's where LiffySoundFM.ie is the website? That is right, yeah. Mick right. at LiffySoundFM.ie Yeah, Alan uh, Laws, who was just on with us tonight, might be on with Mick tomorrow night. Alan's uh, agreed to go on with Mick. So we have to organise the uh, communication there, sort it out. And I'm sure that'll uh, be another good interview and Mick will go in depth with him. And a just, few other bits and pieces. And we can just say, for if you're, if you're in the Lucan area, you can actually hear that on FM. 
if you're going to be passing by there, you'll actually hear it on your FM dial. Uh, I think it's 96, in around 96. And uh, uh, LiffySoundFM.ie, there is a player on the website there for those who are outside the Lucan area. Brilliant stuff. Now, on the show next week, it's we, we have planned to have John Flatley on the Flaherty. Flaherty? Michael Flatley? Uh, John Flaherty. Bit of Irish, on, bit of Irish um, To be talking about addiction. Maybe we're going to be talking about addiction in general. Addiction to power, addiction to drugs and all that kind of stuff. But also, as Steve said um, earlier on the show, that he met up with John, or not John. Paul Murphy. Paul Murphy. And we did email Paul, and if Paul can come on next week, we will move John back and um, get Paul on, because um, it would be great to have Paul on and do a show with Paul. So watch out during the week for the actual schedule. And uh, we, we, you'll see on there who's going to be on. Uh, we'll make the change. Now, as I said earlier in the show, that we are planning to launch the new uh, OAM website, hopefully during the week, if everything goes okay. Uh, fingers crossed. So keep an eye on that as well. And we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll be looking for any politicians to cut the ribbon on the new website. Yeah, then, yeah. <laughs> there's something that I'd like to cut. It wouldn't be a ribbon, though. You know? Yeah, Ray Butler's <laughs> false pretense to say, we, want, we need you to launch our new website. Yeah, exactly. And snag an interview. Mm, yeah, I can I can see that happening, all right. So that's basically what's planned. So we updated the Facebook page. As I say, some of the information um, didn't copy over. That's just the way Facebook does it. But we can have, we have access to it. We did a, a data backup on that. So if people want to see that any of that old uh, old images that we had, we can put them back up, no problem. And the launch, we'll email people before we do the, sw- the, the switch over and let you know what's going on. And that's the plan for next week. Um, this week... Um, Nothing, it just it seems to be an awful lot going on. That's all I'll say. I mean, last week an awful lot went on, and it, for every week, and even globally, there's a lot of things escalating and going on, and it's just unbelievable what's trying to keep tabs on everything is just it's very difficult. But uh, we do our best anyway. So, again, if you have any links or any stories, email them into us, and we'll do our best to get them on the show. But uh, for myself, have a good week. Uh, stay safe. For myself, Alan James, take it easy. We'll catch you next week. Okay, for myself, Stephen George, have a great one. Have a good week. Uh, stay tuned to People's Internet Radio if you're on the stream. And uh, it's going to be Chris Fogarty on with Vin. And uh, yes, speaking of addiction, Chris, you are an OIM addict. You've been with us from the beginning. And long may it stay away. For myself, Stephen George, we'll do it all again next week. Good night.